Thank you so much. Um, you know, when, when you become a writer, you, you meet lots of other writers and um, they, they say, you start to hear a little bit of whispers about, oh, don't go here, or this place has a really good event. Or, and I hope you guys appreciate um, what Gwen and Learn It Owl have in conjunction built here. It's really special. And this is becoming a place where authors are like, you should go to Hudson. Um, because there are good readers there. There are people who ask smart questions. Um, and there, are, there really are just a handful of places like that. I mean, St. Louis, I was there a few nights ago. That's one of them, their, their library system. Um, I, well, I shouldn't say it, but it, I, have a, I have a friend who just looked at me once and said, take Kansas City off of your schedule. And I did. So it really matters. I mean, um, are any of you from Kansas City? <laughs> um, so, so I, I just am grateful to Gwen and to all of you, and and I'm so uh, pleased to be back. And um, I'm not really that nice. <laughs> Last time someone yelled at me because I didn't know. Is Barbara McIntyre? No, I guess not. Last, oh, there you are. Yes, I, uh, I, I, I stood up and I said, uh, "What is this food I see everywhere called a, a po pocky?" or a, a pookie, and the whole crowd stared at me and said, do you mean a punch key like that? And uh, so since then, I've become a punch key de devotee. Um, or is that, am I still saying it wrong? No, punch key, right? Yeah. Oh, you don't know what a punch key is? Now she's the new person. Everyone yell at her this time instead of me, because last time everyone came up to the table and said, you don't know what punch keys are. I said, I'm sorry. Um, this is, so this is my book. Uh, this is The Last Passenger, and um, it, it was a real joy to write, and I think maybe I'll read a little bit, if that's okay, from it. Um, I'm going to read the, the last page. <laughs> the butler had finished murdering everyone. No, um, the, uh, this is the third in, in a trilogy of prequels to the main series I write. And um, so the main character who's 40 or 45 in those books is uh, only 21 or 22 here. And I was thinking about it. A lot of people are every, this is the eighth or ninth city I've been to in the last eight or nine days. And um, everyone is saying, you know, why did you write the prequels? And I don't have a good answer. So please don't ask that. But one thing I was thinking is, you know, I wrote the first book when I was maybe 23 or 24 and I made him 40 and now I'm almost 40 and he's 23. So <laughs> something's going on. Eventually I'll write about him as an infant solving <laughs> mysteries in the nursery, but not yet. So I'll read a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Chapter one. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to think if I need to give any background. No. On or about the first day of October 1855, the city of London, England, decide, oh, can you hear me? In the, okay, good. Am I too loud? <laughs> um, decided it was time once and for all that Charles Lennox be married. Lennox himself didn't even necessarily disagree. He lived a happy life as a bachelor in the passage through Mayfair, known as Hamden Lane. Mayfair is sort of the posh part of um, London. But for the first time had reached a stage when he could admit that a wife might settle his days into a still more contented rhythm. Nevertheless, the city's vehemence and its new con conviction about his future came as a surprise. On the second Tuesday of the month at an evening salon at Lady Saddles, a footman discreetly handed him a note. Mary Elizabeth Sharples, throw into fire. He studied this epistle for a moment. He knew the handwriting. He looked over at Mary Elizabeth Sharples holding a tiny glass of almond brandy across the room, a violet shawl around her shoulders. Uh, <laughs> I was in Chicago a couple of nights ago and I read the same thing. And at the very end, a little hand went up at the back and I said, yeah. And she said, hi, uh, I'm a Mary Elizabeth Sharples. So <laughs> someone, someone won a contest. <laughs> If you gave it up to charity, you got to have your name in the book. And I'd forgotten that. And I said, excuse me, we are who? And she said, and I said, I think there's a crazy person here. But it turned out she'd won the contest. So as you're about to see, I made her 6'6", six, six, which she, in real life, she was about 5'3". Um, she said, at least you made me rich. Uh, 
She was, she was a handsome woman in her third London season, Kentish, immensely rich, and also a fair four or five inches above six feet tall, and of greater significance than any of that, helplessly in love with the gentleman standing next to her at just this moment. Um, and then it goes on a bit about that. Lennox glanced across the room toward his friend, Lady Jane. This is a recurring character, Lady Jane, in the books. It was she who had passed the note by the footman. She was now in the midst of an animated conversation with her husband, James, and two gentlemen from his regiment in the Coldstream Guards. He managed to catch her eye, however, and she returned his gaze queryingly. Lady Jane and Lennox had known each other since they were children. She was perhaps a year younger than Mary Elizabeth Sharples, and a good ten inches shorter. She was plain but pretty, with dimpled cheeks, kind gray eyes, and hair that fell in soft, dark curls. This evening she wore a wide blue crinoline. Do you all know what that is? I guess ever I didn't, uh, or I sort of did. I own a few. Um, this 1855 was actually the year in which Queen Victoria wore a crinoline for the first time, and so it immediately caught fire. And there are these huge hoops that go around your, so you have to walk sideways. <laughs> Can't really dance, but it was the fashion. I remember her, there was a famous story about her son had rheumatism. And so he had to shake hands like this uh, one week when he had a really bad flare up. And immediately everyone in London started shaking hands like this, thinking that that was the, just the fashionable way to do it. So uh, Lady Jane and Lennox had known each other since, the, oh, yeah, she was, he crossed the room toward her. An icy pewter cup of punch in hand. When she was just loose from the group's conversation, Lennox said, hello, Jane. Ah, hello, Charles, she said innocently. He leaned in close. Shall I really throw her into the fire? Excuse me? I'll do it if you insist, but I think people would notice. I'm almost sure. She looked at him crossly. What are you talking about? He consulted the note. He wrote, Mary Elizabeth Sharples, he said in a quiet voice throw into fire. <laughs> a look of wrath came onto Jane's face. The note, you fool. You're supposed to throw the note into the fire. Oh, the note. Yes, the note, as you very well know. I was planning to eat the note, he said. She shook her head. How I hate you. So it had been for weeks, mysteriously. Ancient, distant, respectable cousins had dropped in on Lennox after years of silence, mentioning their friends' grandnieces. Peers from his school days delicately proffered their sisters. Even his close friends, Lady Jane, for instance, and his brother Edmund, seemed to think he was in desperate want of a wife. Part of it was no doubt that the season had just begun. The season lasted then from October to May, I think. After the long summer in which those who could mostly retreated from the city into the clearer air of the countryside, all had returned, and every night there was a different salon or ball. Still, this was Lennox's sixth autumn in London and the assaults upon his liberty had never been this concerted or numerous. Thank you very much. Um, so that sort of sets the scene. This is a mystery, but um, it also has an element because it's part of this prequel trilogy of uh, a love story. And so, you know, I, I, this writing the prequels has forced me to think about what he was like when he was young. And I figured, well, I guess he must've been in love once, not just sort of like a vestal virgin saving himself for his, eventual wife um and so that was sort of a thrill i had to learn about all the little minor minor details of courtship uh back then it was all very rigidly managed as i'm sure you can imagine um, who you were allowed to see and when who you were allowed to speak to so the book has a lot of that and um i think when i was writing it i was rereading jane austen and that sort of infected my brain in a good way good the good kind of brain infection <laughs> um has anyone watched Sanditon or no? No, I haven't watched it yet, but I've heard only, is it good? Yeah. Medium, I, I'm getting a medium and a good, good, okay, maybe I'll watch it. And then there's an Emma too coming out. What was I talking about? Anyway, um, Jane Austen. So that's The Last Passenger and I hope um, you will give it a read, I either get it out of the library or Urban Learn Owl. Um, and if not, that's okay too. And uh, I would love to take some questions if anyone has any. Yeah, they're all in audio, and um, I've never listened to them. <laughs> I, I I can't. I I think it would make me too nervous. I'd be like, ah, oh, that's bad. That's bad. That's bad. That's bad. So, but people do like them. Yes. Uh, 
For sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm glad that that's yes, I, I do do a lot of research um, and I do have a history. I have a history and an English background. Um, English, English. So, yeah, I, I grew up really addicted to a lot of writers like Jane Austen and George Eliot and a lot of Sherlock Holmes. Um, yeah, that was my mom. Did I say that? Yes. Yeah, my mom. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I remember my mom when I was little, she was a single mom and she would take me to the library and I would get all 10 books on my card and nine on hers and she would get out one book. Because when you're a kid, you read just those little short books. And I was really rough on books. I uh, go and shut your ears. I would drop them into the tub or I would, you know, lose them at school and she never got mad and she always took me back every Monday. And, and that's how I sort of became, yeah, a writer. Are you shaking your head because I dropped the books in the tub? I'm sorry. I was I was 10 in my defense. Uh, any other question? Yes? Are you going to go back to the later? Um, the oh, great question. Um, yes, I am. So the question was, am I going to go back to the later one? I'm actually doing that now. And um, I'm... I think I'm going to write about him going to America for the first time, which is I'm um, excited to potentially write about um, America and, and what it was like in the 1870s, because it's a subject I know less well. So the research is often the most fun part of writing these books for me. And so I'm reading about um, what it was like back then. Yeah. Maybe I'll send them to Hudson. I don't know. Was Hudson here in 1870? Yes. Okay, good. Did they have punch keys? <laughs> Maybe I will put a punch key in the book. I feel like that would be a good little detail. I don't know. I could put the tusk in the book. Too. Yes? Oh. <laughs> the most worthless man in England. Um, it's such a good question. You know, I... All of my answers are out of date. I, I do. I, I am in conversations about turning it into a series. And so I should have a good answer. For years, I said, um, did anyone see that movie, The Winslow Boy with Jeremy Northam? He was great in it. And I thought he would be a good Lennox, but I think he's too old now. So on my Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Charles Finch author, we have these lively discussions and they all have ideas. I think someone said Eddie Redmayne would be good at it, but you say no. <laughs> Who do you think it should be? Um, uh, Brad Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll play Lennox. I could do it probably. No. <laughs> Oh, Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah. Yeah, he could be older. He would be perfect. Okay, I'll call him. I'll, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. So I don't know how it works, or I, I know a little more than I used to, but I, I mean, it, there's a producer who's interested who works for Netflix. Um, so that would be. So we'll see. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. A lot of these things tend to d dissolve in your hands, uh, you know, so I'm not holding out any great expectations. But. Well, it's not like mysteries are unpopular. <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry. Uh, how did I start to write a mystery? You know, I, I always loved reading mysteries and, um, I loved sort of the Victorian feeling mysteries. Like I loved Wilkie Collins and stuff like that. And so I felt very at home in that, in that space. I felt like, um, I just, I felt like I could get the atmosphere and I felt like I've never been great at the puzzle element of it, but I tried to write okay puzzles. I don't know. So yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. You're going to give me a midlife crisis. <laughs> Um, I did not. <laughs> oh, 
Right. No, I uh, I just did it really badly and then got gradually better. <laughs> so that's I, it's just you know it's like learning to do anything. I think you have to just kind of trial and error your way toward getting better at it. And I feel um, I feel a little more competent at, at it now. Uh, oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> Great question. It was if I spent a lot of time in England. Um, I do. And, you know, I I try to go there every year or two. I used to live there for a few years. Um, I, have, may, I may have told this story already, but I, I was at the lot, my own library uh, a couple of years ago in Chicago. And um, the librarian said, oh, Charles Finch, there's a writer named that. <laughs> And I said, oh, I think you might mean me. I'm a writer. And she said, no, he's British. <laughs> and I said, I really think you mean me. And she said, no, he's this tall, handsome British guy. Who <laughs> I said, okay, <laughs> well, I guess it's a different guy. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I love going there because you can, you will walk by a little doorway and it'll say like 17 12 and you look up the address and it turns out it was the you know queen the king's executioner's house or something like that and then you're down a little rabbit hole so i go around with my notebook and scribble stuff down and try to get the get it right in my ear if that makes sense um yeah yes oh how are the books received in england you know what's funny is they like really bloody serial killer type stuff more which is they don't you know they they, I don't know that people in Germany really like these books and, um, what other countries, India, these books are really popular and, and here they're relatively popular, but England, they have their fans, but not, not nearly as many as like, um, the girl, you know, the girl with the dragon to do or whatever the a real serial killer book would be. That's what they like. Ian Rankin, do you know him or, um, that's, that's sort of the taste that, they have a dark taste, which is not my, I like like ton of French. I like, uh, but yeah. Yes. Um, how important are the editors to me? I ignore everything they say. No, <laughs> vitally important. Uh, I, the, you know, I'm lucky. I have an editor with whom I have a really good and close relationship and what he's really gifted at is looking at the big picture and saying, well, this part, you could move it here because it might help the character development. I, he tends to leave me alone on the language because that's where I am very painstaking myself. Um, but everyone's different. Some have editors who just mark up everything they write and some refuse to be edited. I know that uh, Anne Rice, does anyone? She, I, I haven't actually read much of her work, but she, about 10 years ago, stopped <laughs> accepting edits, which from a writer's perspective seems absolutely insane, but I don't know, maybe the books are, yeah. There's only one book recently that had that Harper Lee second book. Oh, yeah. Um, there were absolutely no edits. Wow, yeah, Harper Lee. I mean, you gotta give her a swing at no edits, I guess, it's fair enough. But um, for me, very important, yeah. That's find a good editor, that's maybe the advice, yeah. Maybe your sister, right? Yes. As long as you buy them, it's. Uh, <laughs> oh, good. Is it important to read them in order? And and do I have a favorite one? Um. I don't know. Is it important to read them in order? Has anyone here read them? Yes or no? She says yes. So yeah. Yeah, I think they stand alone in terms of each one, but maybe it's a richer experience if you go in order. But also the ones I started out doing, I now like cringe when I look at them because I think they're so uh, amateur. I, you know, I've gotten, I don't know, I would do, but there, that's, I, I shouldn't disavow them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe start with, with the prequels. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and then what was the other question? Oh, what do I have a favorite one? I do, I do. I like uh, the orange one. What's it called? <laughs> the Inheritance. 
Um, I actually don't, I don't really try, I try not to remember them because I feel like, a, you, I don't know if it's true what they say, like a shark, if it stops swimming forward, it dies. I feel like that about the books. Like if I turn back, I'll turn into a pillar of salt. I don't know why. Um, yeah, it's a strange feeling. I just don't, but I, I remember loving that one at the time. Take that for what it's worth. Probably nothing. Yeah. Yeah. My own children. <laughs> um, well, my I have one daughter who's five, so she's read them all. No, <laughs> um, uh, no, and I, you know, no, I have I have four brothers and sisters, and I don't think anyone has read a single word of them. I faithfully send them signed copies every time, but I kind of like that. I like that they don't, you know, I, they're off living their own lives. They don't need to read thirteen books about a, a detective. Um, and they're there for them if they ever want to. Yes? So I have a shallow question because these have been very great questions. But in this last book, Deer gives a toast, and you seem to indicate that there is a special glass. Oh, yeah. Is there really such a thing? Yes, yeah. Huh. Um, there, that's, uh, that's the kind of detail that I come across, and I stow away and it's funny you bring that one up because i had that for years and i never had occasion to use it but i keep a notebook with all the i tend to drop a lot of sort of word histories in or little details about history and um so i, I keep a little notebook and sometimes it'll be seven or eight years and they make this kind of glass that is extremely thin and it's designed to chime during a toast um particularly but not break and so yeah I, that is a true detail that was not shallow at all. That was a great question. Yes. Hi. Um, you have a Who else do I look forward to? Is that you? Well, who else do you look for? Uh, hmm, that's a great question. Who has a book that comes out? And I, I like Michael Connolly a lot. He's like sort of the best, I think, at um, just if you're talking about like building an engine of plot, he's just built these amazing. And you know that you can find that anywhere. I mean, like some some great writers are terrible at it, and some really bad writers are. Um, but for literary fiction, I, I'm trying to think who I love um, recently. I really like Colson Whitehead. I like his books. Um, every time someone asks me this, I forget every book I've ever read. <laughs> I'm rereading Harry Potter. Uh, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about that. It's a children's series. <laughs> It's no. quite popular. Um, I, I'm rereading that because I'm trying to figure out if my five-year-old daughter is old enough. I don't know. I think maybe one or two more years. Do any of you have children you read Harry Potter to? What age do you do? What age do you start? Twelve? So I have to wait seven years? Oh, I love that. Okay. Really? Okay. All right. So six and twelve. Well, and I also want to read uh, *The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe*, but then the lion gets gets like uh, really beat up in the end there. So I don't know what age to. Basically, I'm trying to say I'm a terrible father and who has no idea what to do. Right now, we're reading. Um, oh gosh, all the Little House books, which is a lot of fun. That's great. Boy, they they really went through it. They're always like about to drown or something. <laughs> My daughter's like, is that gonna happen? I'm like, no. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? Yes. Are you the only writer in your family? Oh, uh, great question. Am I the only writer in my family? My grandmother was a writer. Um, I am the only fiction writer, I guess I would say. Everyone writes good emails. <laughs> I'd say everyone's a funnier writer than I am and probably better, but I uh, I made it my job, so yeah. Yes? I have a second question. How does it work with endorsements from other authors? I seem to recollect that you had a ringing endorsement from Louise Penny. Yeah. Cool. And I mean, I would have read it, you didn't have to have any endorsements. I, I love what you write, but okay. how does it work? Do you, do you invite someone that you have met to do that, or do you, your publisher do that? Well, you get a bag of cash, and <laughs> no, 
Um, it's it's tricky. I mean, it's one of those things where when you really need endorsements, they're very hard to get because you don't know anyone and you're new. And then when you don't need them quite as much, they come flooding in. And then, so Louise became a friend of mine and I admire her work so much. And um, we did a few events together and, and um, she said, you know, if you ever need a, a, a blurb as they're called, just tell me. And so I said, sure, I will take one. <laughs> yeah, I'll take one of those. Um, so. Excuse me? Oh, Louise, I think she had a new book out just a few months ago, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, yeah I think she's going to, I think she'll keep going. Uh, yeah, she's, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Well, there's this website, Wikipedia, and no, (laughs) I'm joking. Sorry, that's a bad joke at a research library. Um, I so it's a great question. So I'll often find like something. um, I'm trying to think of a good example. I'll find out about a little church that was built in like 1200, and then I try whenever I can to find like original sources um, and to try to if there's a good book about it or something like that. Each book sort of demands a different kind of research, which I love because like I'm always sort of on a new um, trail. Like this had a lot of trains in it. And so I had to figure out, well, why were trains like how did this age of steam come to be? And and what was a train like? Uh, you know, the English are so strange. There, there was a first class, a second class and a third class carriage. And there were these great titans of industry who their whole lives would only ride in the second or third class carriage because that's where they had started. And so they would you sort of stuck to where you were born into. I mean, it was very, I would have just gotten a first class ticket if I had made a million pounds digging coal out of the ground, but they would say, no, I'm gonna stay in the second class. So little details like that, I'll read things from the time or histories of the time and no Wikipedia, sorry. Yes. Yes, I love to use newspapers from the time period. especially for language. And if I ever get stuck for names, I have a stack of old newspapers and they were all named like, like, you know, thankful for Jesus Smith or something like that. And so I will, I'll try to find a name based on, on those. Cause they'll say, you know, thankful for Jesus Smith is accused of shooting two people at, at um, Paddington station. And so, yeah, I, I use those for color and things like that. Yeah. So history and English, and then I did, um, when I studied in England, I did Renaissance literature, which has yet to prove any (laughs) utility so far, but I'm still hoping. Um, I had a friend who got a doctorate in in this subject, and I said, if they ever call for a doctor on a plane, you should go right up and say, (laughs) what do you need me to read? so that that was I, it was always I was always just a reader, and so English and history were the the ways that I could just read all day in college without having to go to a lab or anything, and that kind of like bled I bled into my start as a writer, I think. Um, I t- I'm trying to think. I think I tend to, at the start of a book, write more longhand, and I have a bunch of different notebooks, and this, I don't think there's a system. You're allowed to have a system? Is that true? Uh, I have... Oh, I do. I, <laughs> I Well, so I have a, a definite system for keeping, jotting down things that I want to remember, um, and then I'll comb through that if I need you know, a character or... I'll see a little interaction at the grocery store and try to write it down in my notebook. And sometimes that will be the start of a chapter. Um, So yeah, no, I don't have a good system, but I have a system. I suppose so, yeah. Yeah. Mm What are your go-to references for the updates you write about places in England that more than 100 years ago, 
Yeah. Of course, yeah. Um, I tend to just sort of make mistakes. <laughs> um, I what I do is my the thing I look at the most is the Oxford English Dictionary because that can tell you whether. I should go back. To me, the most important part of reading a book is, is the experience of the atmosphere, like whether I believe it. So you can get all of your facts right. And if I feel like your dialogue is inaccurate to the time or something like that, I just don't feel like I'm there. So that to me comes first. So I'll read Sir Walter Scott or something like that to try to get into the ear of what they were like. I had a, I, I may have told this story before, but I had a, um, I got an email once, I get a lot of emails with minor corrections, but I got an email once from a librarian from Omaha, Omaha, I think. And she said, here are all the mistakes in your first six books. <laughs> and it was a like an eight page document. And I thought that was kind of funny and I was gonna write back, I didn't. And then the next day um, I got an email that said, have you attended to this yet? <laughs> And I said, I barely ate breakfast. I haven't attended to it yet, but I will. I, and there's stuff exactly like you said, like these two streets don't cross or something. But I tend to worry less probably to the detriment of the books, but I worry less about that than about having characters who sound like they could be, you know, at a mall. Like I, that's what would really bother me if that, does that make sense? Yeah. Any other? Oh, yeah. You've been compared recently to Ken Harris. And they said Oh, thank you. Yes, that was the Washington Post said that about this book. Yeah, so I was thrilled by that. I'm a fan of her books. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, do you, do you want to go on? And <laughs> <laughs> if you have any others in your pocket, <laughs> no, that was wonderful. Yeah, I think I'm getting the signal to leave. No, do you want me to leave? Oh, oh yes, okay. Gwen. Celebrity what? Readers, people that are celebrities that have read your book that have loved it. Oh yeah. I. Uh yes. Uh, Dwayne the Rock Johnson is a huge fan. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I do have. You know who Hillary Clinton is a big fan. Um, she she. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, Taya Leone. Does anyone know who that? Remember who that is? Um, yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a nice fan note from her. Anna Quindlin. I don't know if anyone knows her. She's wonderful. Um, you know who surprised me? It was D David McCullough, who writes those big, fat biographies. And I thought, my books? You, the, the, your, you write such big uh, thousand-page John Adams biographies and stuff. But he said, I read them the day they come out. Um, there are a couple others that I can't remember. But, um, oh, Brie, Brie Larson. She's an actress. Uh, I don't know what she was in. She was in, you know, she was in Room, I think. Yeah. She's, uh, yeah. I need to come up with some more. I need to send them to celebrities. Yeah. Ooh. That's actually a process that interested me because I, when it, yeah, they're all in audio and it's been the same reader the whole time. And, um, it's a, a guy named James Langton. And as I said, I, I haven't listened to them or reread them or anything. But I, they sent me, I think, five samples. And they said, if none of these are good, let us know and we'll send you others. And they had them all read, I think, the first chapter of the first book. And it was really like a light going off in a dark room. I was, it was the third or fourth one. And I listened to the others. But I, it was just like, oh, yeah, that's what it sounds like in my head. So, yeah. Yes. Oh, it's so important. Yeah. It really does. And so, yeah, that, yeah, exactly. I agree. I'm not an audiobook person, but uh, uh, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, I think I was 25 or 6, so it was 2006. Hmm. Well, maybe t total lack of other abilities. <laughs> um, no, I, you know, I, 
I, you know, for years, I think I was, I lied because I was not intentionally lying, but I, people would say, when did you become a writer? And I would say, oh, you know, when I was 10 or 11, I started writing. And then I realized that I love to read from such a young age so much. And then I started writing and I realized that they are never really that separate in my mind. Um, and so I think I've just always been either reading or writing. And to me, they don't feel like parts of a different part of myself. So maybe that is being, having a feeling called to do, I don't know. Uh, that's just the only way I know. It's so hard to know how different you are than other people. Like I, I, cause I know lots of people who love to read and I just don't feel that different, but I, I do write books. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. It's a bad answer, but no. well, thank you. <laughs> Oh, good question. How did I? Uh, well, I was a student for some of that time. Um, I was a graduate student, and I thought if if I can't be a writer, maybe I'll try to be a professor or something. Um, I was a bartender. I was a very very bad bartender. <laughs> I would really panic if anyone ordered a, like a a drink with a name. <laughs> I don't know, like a beer I could do, but the second they would say a name, I would. <laughs> but you know what I figured out is that a lot of people at a bar are drunk. So, so they'll, they'll, they'll come in and say, one Sazerac or something, or an old fashioned. And so I learned to just sort of nod and then make something brown. And then they'd be like, oh, this is pretty good. <laughs> As if they were connoisseurs <laughs> you know, of liquor. And so uh, around the six month mark, I figured out you can fool most of the people most of the time when it comes to just drinking. Yes. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, schedule and, and everything like that. Um, I do try to write every day. I try to be at my desk for a few hours. And the rule I have, I've become more forgiving of myself as time has gone on. I used to stand up after my few hours and think like, oh, you've got barely anything today. But now I think there are just gonna be days where it's much harder or where you don't, where you only come up with one sentence or where you just, but as long as you are sit down every day with neither hope nor despair as uh, Zora Neale, Neale Hurston said, and just sit there and try to let your mind do the work. Some days it will be great and some days it won't. And so now if I have a bad day, I'm like, well, I'll, I'll have a good day tomorrow. And then in the afternoons, I tend to catch up on reading or I do a lot of criticism um, and I use that for for that stuff. But the morning is when I, I feel you still, I still feel like a little sleepy and a little susceptible to less critical of my own ideas in the morning and, and a little bit more foggy brained, which I think can be good if you're trying to be creative. Maybe one or two more. Yeah. Whew. Do I feel that it reveals something about me when I put words down on paper? I think inevitably, yes. There's a, in Job, someone says, uh, if only my enemy would write a book. <laughs> because it, it, there's a sense that if your enemy writes a book, you'll know everything about them. And so I think uh, inadvertently, I've probably revealed a lot about myself that I didn't even intend to, um, especially in this character, Lennox, because you can't write this much about someone without it being Partially you, yeah. Um, yeah, but it, that would take someone, I don't know, it's hard for me to assess how, how much. But yeah, I'm in a way, I'm I'm in every character, I suppose. I don't know. If I, if I can't feel like the inside of a character's mind with my mind, then, then I give them up because I feel like, I don't know, yeah. Well, you know, women buy 80% of books, they say, or something like that. If there were no women, publishing would collapse um, immediately. And the world population, probably. Um, but um, so, so I think everyone's target audience is women, except for maybe, uh, I don't know, Bill O'Reilly. Uh, <laughs> I feel like if I see a, a man reading a book on a plane, it's a Bill O'Reilly book, usually. Um, 
target audience. I, I just want someone who is, I, I, sure, yeah. And I want someone who just, I, I want someone who likes to read, I guess. That's, which sounds so simple, but that's not everyone. I mean, we're kind of a small, weird group within. <laughs> Most people are not avid readers. And so I feel like those are my brothers and sisters. Hey, maybe two more. I write by hand if I'm feeling slow brained or if I am confused about plot or if I really need to. But then there are times when I go to the computer, the majority of the time, because I'm like, oh, I'm, I need to type, 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 because uh, my brain goes too fast to go with the pen. But everyone, there's no right or wrong, I think. Yeah. Uh, so my first book, I, I did not, I got to two, page 220 or so, and I realized I didn't know who the murderer was. I was like, gosh, I should probably pin this on someone. I, I don't know. And that is not the way to do it, I can tell you. Uh, now I have like an idea, but it, if someone leaps out halfway through, I'm happy to change. I try to stay limber about my sort of ideas, but um, I do have a better idea now because that was like one of the worst weeks of my life when I was like, wait, I have all these suspects, but I don't know who did it, so <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, what other era I would want to write about? Um, I really, I've thought a lot about writing about the World War II era because I find it so interesting, um, especially Western Europe and, and what life was like during the war, um, what life was like here during the war too. So I thought about maybe like, what if Lennox's grandson was a spy during World War II or stuff like that, but that's, that's still all in my head, I don't know. But one day, yes. Maybe one more question. No, after all those, you can't even go, okay, yeah. Oh, go on, yeah. That's a great idea, yeah. The Agatha Christie estate might have something to say about it. <laughs> Um, but I love that idea. Yeah, no, I love that idea. And actually a friend of mine, Sophie Hanna, uh, writes the, the current Agatha Christie, what are the branded Agatha Christie books. So maybe I'm going to tell her, tell her to do that. She's great. If you haven't written, right. Um, yeah. Thank you all so much. I'm so honored that you came. Thank you. And I'll see some of you in the background.